afterwards. Uh, but we are going to in, 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 and we are going to record these two talks as well, and we are going to send the links uh, to you uh, in the in the email afterwards. Okay, so that's that's the, all the housekeeping items, and uh, let's get started with the talk. And uh, and the first talk is by Fabrizio, and uh, his talk is about uh, crosses series and isomonodromic deformations. Okay, please get started. Yes, I'm starting to share the screen. All right, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to give this talk. Uh, before starting, I just wanted to express a word in solidarity of my colleagues and friends from Ukraine that right now are being forced to either flee or fight witnessing a terrible war in their home country. And this is particularly uh, on point because of the title of this workshop, uh, the Kiev formula, which was formulated by a full uh, Ukrainian team. And the Kiev formula is part of uh, a, a bridge that is being constructed between uh, topics in quantum field theory and string theory and topics in mathematical physics and specifically integrable system. And this touches uh, many different topics on both sides from supersymmetric QFTs, uh, conformal field theory, string theory, uh, but on the mathematical physics side, we have WKB approximation, uh, random matrices, uh, a lot of different topics. And uh, an important pillar of this bridge is the Kiev formula that provides a, a quantitative, uh, very explicit um, match between the two sides. And of course, yesterday you saw the relation between conformal field theory and Van Levy equations. And today I will instead focus on another specific instance of this correspondence, which involves four dimensional supersymmetric quantum field theory and isomonodromic deformations of which Van Levy equations are a special instance. And since this uh, is supposed to be an introductory lecture, uh, I will try to be, uh, to, to assume as little as possible, uh, especially on the physics side. And I will uh, start by introducing the physical theories that we will be dealing with, which are known as classes theories. These are specified by uh, some Riemann surfaces, um, to each theory specified by a Riemann surface with marked points. And in the second part of the talk, I will associate to a vacuum of this theory an integrable system, a finite dimensional integrable system known as a Hitchin system. And uh, I will uh, show how, sorry. There's Siri that is going crazy. And um, I was saying that, yes, and I will show how deformations of these integrable systems and deformations of the underlying QFT uh, arise uh, from deformations of the Riemann surface. And finally, uh, I will show how the Kiev formula, the explicit combinatorics of the Kiev, Kiev formula, arises uh, explicitly when one studies these tau functions expressed as fragment determinants. So, this will be mainly a whiteboard talk, and uh, please ask questions whenever you want. So let us introduce what are these classes theories. So here, I will not um, enter much into the specific of which kind of theories these are in general, in general, but rather on the construction and how it relates to the mathematical side. And the starting point is uh, a six-dimensional theory. To th these classes theories are four-dimensional theories. But to define them, we start from six dimensions in a theory which has n equals to 2 comma 0 supersymmetry, and it is a superconformal theory. 
Now to properly define this six dimensional theory one, we would have to recur to string theory, but um, I will try to avoid all the talks about string theory and just talk about quantum field theory quantities. So we know that there's a six dimensional theory. It has uh, this supersymmetry algebra and these theories are classified by an ADE classification. So once you specify your uh, amount of supersymmetry and you specify an ADE Lie algebra, uh, you know what theory you're talking about and we will focus on the A1 theory in this lecture because it's the one that is relevant for Pan-Levy equations. And the way that one obtains one goes to four dimensions from six dimension is to compactify on a Riemann surface C G comma N Riemann surface. And here G is the genus and N is some number of marked points That we specify on the Riemann surface. And these marked points will acquire some more analytical meaning uh, in a bit, but for now let's just think of them as some singular point on the Riemann surface that we are exciting from the Riemann surface. So the problem with this picture of going uh, from 6D to 4D by considering the theory on R4 time some Riemann surface is that in general this background this uh, compactification breaks all supersymmetry now that might be fine depending breaking all the supersymmetry might be fine depending on what you want to do but we want to keep four dimensional n equals to two supersymmetry and what this what this means is that the symmetry algebra of the six dimensional theory is a super algebra which is osp 6 comma 2 dash 4 and we want to find a subalgebra of OSP 6 to 4 isomorphic to the n equals to 2 super Poincare algebra. Now, for those of you that might not uh, quite remember this algebra. It's, it has, of course, all its uh, Poincare generators, translations and rotation in four dimensional Minkowski space. But then we have supercharges that are anti commuting generators, and they are Q alpha i and Q bar alpha dot j. And here, alpha and alpha dot go from one to two and are vile spinner indices, while this i and j go from one to three, and there are some SO3 global symmetry uh, indices. These charges are vile spinners in four dimensions and they transform under an SO3 symmetry. And their anti-commutator schematically is that Q, Q bar is P, the, point, the translation generator, and then Q, Q is Z, Q bar, Q bar is Z bar. But these are referred to as central charges. So how does the six dimensional superconformal algebra relate to this? Let us look for simplicity only at the bosonic 
part of these superalgebras. So the bosonic subalgebra of this is the five-dimensional Poincaré. Well, this is the boost, and you have a semi-private product with the translation. Uh, sorry, 60. Um, plus an SO5 global symmetry. The R means R symmetry. This global symmetry are known, are known as R symmetry. And when we compactify instead, so here we are on, remember, on R4 times the stream and surface. When we compactify, we have our four dimensional Poincare algebra, an SO2 holonomy algebra of the Riemann surface. And these are kind of the space time symmetries. But then we have that this SO5 decomposes as an SO3 plus SO2. Now, the problem is that in general, if you, if you split, if you make the splitting naively, the splitting of representation, you won't find supercharges that transform in the following, in this way, in the way that they're supposed to. So you won't be able to preserve supersymmetry. The way that one solves this problem is to do what is called a partial topological twist. The partial topological twist means that uh, we take the holonomy algebra of the Riemann surface not to be just the one that comes from the six-dimensional space-time symmetry, but the diagonal subalgebra of this SO2 CGN and SO2R. So we're mixing these R symmetries with space-time symmetries, but only for what concerns the stream and surface. And then we can look at how the six dimensional supercharges transform under this SO13, the uh, four dimensional uh, Lorentz group, SO3R, and this SO2 twist. The result is that the supercharges, we, we get uh, two sets of supercharges that transform in this way. Two, one, two. I'll explain this in a moment. One, two, two, minus one. And this means that these are vial spinners of opposite chiralities in four dimensions. Fundamental representation of this SO3. And this is exactly what, what we wanted, right? Because this means that we file spinner, fundamental representation, opposite chirality, fundamental representation. But this SO2 twist chart means that they transform non-trivially on the Riemann surface. They're not scalars on the Riemann surface. So these are not good supercharges for the n equals to two supersymmetry algebra in four dimension. Uh, instead, but, but we also have another set of charges, which are scalars transform exactly in the correct way, and they are scalars on the Riemann surface. And this is because we mixed this space-time symmetries and global symmetries. But an important consequence of this construction is that some of the 60 supercharges, so some of the 60 generators, are not scalars on the Riemann surface. And this will be important uh, in, in the rest of the construction. So 
please stop me at, at any time if you have some questions. Otherwise, I'll just go on. So uh, why, when does this fact uh, become important, the fact that some of the supercharges are not scalars? Well, when we st study the moduli space of vacuum of this theory in the Coulomb branch, so Coulomb branch just means that the low energy theory on this vacuum is some super quantum electrodynamic. This is the Coulomb branch. It's like the low energy phase of electrodynamics. And the vacua uh, on the Coulomb branch are parametrized. So the vacua are parametrized by chiral operators. And if we study this type of operators, it is uh, one can do it in several ways, but I will give you as a fact that the A1 theory has only one such operator. And, and chiral just means that this operator Q bar of O2 is zero. So it's an operator that is annihilated by this uh, Q bar supercharges, all of them. And in the A1 theory, there is only one such operator and it has SO2 R charge two. But remember this uh, SO2 R charge also determined the tensorial properties of the uh, of this operator on the Riemann surface. So the fact that it, that this operator has SO2 R charge two means that the object phi two of Z, which is dz tensor squared times the VEV of this operator is a quadratic differential on this puncture Riemann surface. So what we what we have is that due to this topological twist, this partial topological twist, uh, because the theory is not topological, it's, it's topological twist only on the Riemann surface, uh, the vacua are parameterized not by functions, but by quadratic differentials on the Riemann surface. And these are actually holomorphic quadratic differential on the Riemann surface with the points removed. They will be meromorphic. They, they, they admit poles on these uh, points and the, the type of poles that the quadratic differential has determines what type of puncture this is. So in words is the statement is that the Coulomb branch is meromorphic meromorphic quadratic differentials CGN and actually B is the zeroth cohomology group CGN with values on the second tensor power of the canonical bond. Now, our main uh, object of study, our main theory of study, which will be the one that we will consider in all the concrete examples, will be the genus zero theory with four points. So the theory uh, defined by Riemann sphere with four punctures. So P1 minus four punctures, and we can by global conformal transformation, we can put three of them at zero, one and infinity. And then we have only uh, one that cannot be fixed and we denote by T. And this, the physical theory corresponding to this is an SO2, uh, N equals to two, SO2 super Mills with four 
hypermultiplets. A hypermultiplet is just the matter. So you have the gauge theory, it is coupled to some matter, and the hypermultiplets are uh, this matter, and they're in the fundamental representation of the gauge group. In fact, if we started from the full uh, string theory construction, we, we would have found a precise way to say, okay, I have this Riemann surface. This is uh, this is the theory to which it corresponds. But uh, for 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 our case, we will just consider this sphere with four punctures, and then there is a systematic way to associate a physical theory to this Riemann surface. And at this point, there are two natural questions. And one is this, like what is that we will not address? In general, what is the 4D theory given CGM? But the, the, the other one is more geometrical and, it, and it's the following. And we will address this because this is the one that will allow us to relate to pan Levy equation. So how do we compute concretely this phi 2 for a given class S theory? So, because up to now, we just said, okay, we have our vacua are parameterized by some quadratic differential, but what is this quadratic differential? We want to know what it is, and we want to know what it is in terms of the data, in terms of which we, we define this compactification from six dimension. Are there any questions up to this point? I will go on. And the, the determination of this quadratic differential uh, brings us to the relation between class S theories and Hitchin system. So what we have done up to now what we have described up to now is that we started from this six dimensional superconformal field theory of type A1. And we went to four dimensions by placing this theory on a Riemann surface. We arrived at a, at a four dimensional theory, which is denoted by class S of type A1 and it's determined by this Riemann surface. So if we want to uh, explicitly write down this quadratic differential, a useful trick is to further compactify this theory to three dimensions. So we're considering the original 60 theory on not on R4 times the Riemann surface, but on R3 times a circle times the Riemann surface. And just from general supersymmetry consideration, the low energy three dimensional theory is a nonlinear sigma model whose target space, so a linear sigma model is a quantum field theory of maps uh, from space time to some target space. And this tar target space is what we call the cyber width and modulus space. And it's if we want it, it's just the modular space of vacua of the theory, but compactified in this way of the theory on a circle. And it's a torus vibration over the Coulomb branch. But we can also consider the compactifications in reverse order. 
So we first compactify on S1, and then we arrive at, at five-dimensional n equals to two SU2 super young mills. This SU2 is because we consider the A1 theory. Other, if we consider the AN theory, it would have been uh, SU uh, n plus one. And this is a much simpler theory than the this, this six-dimensional one. This has a Lagrangian. Uh, we can describe it in a rather explicit way. And so we are able to see what happens to this theory when we compactify it uh, on the Riemann surface more easily. So what happens is that, again, because of general supersymmetry consideration, uh, the, we get this three-dimensional n equals to four nonlinear sigma model, but the target space is in this picture is the modular space of BPS, so of supersymmetric configurations of 5D superior mills, which are invariant under R3 translations. So let us see more precisely what this is. So what are these configurations? So in terms of the fields of these five dimensional super young mills, so we can write the action in appropriate normalization this is on R3 times the Riemann surface. And then we have uh, the trace, your super young mills, your young mills action, F wedge star F. And then you have, this is the radius of the circle. Well, um, yes, the, the radius of the original circle, this one. plus R times the exterior covariant derivative of phi i, where star d phi i, plus fermions. This is just the bosonic part of the actions. Of course, there are fermions because this is a supersymmetric theory. So the field content of this five-dimensional theory is a five-dimensional gauge field five-dimensional connection A5D. Let's denote this by F5D. And then we have these five scalars. Because this I runs from one to five, and they're SO5 indices, just as before. And just as before, we're compactifying on the Riemann surface with this partial topological twist. So if we take the, X, the R3 directions to be x0, x3, x5, and the Riemann surface direction to be x1 and x2, we find, because again, this R symmetry indices mix up with the uh, space-time symmetries on the Riemann surface, we find that the combination phi z, which is phi1, plus phi two for square root of two and phi z bar, which is of course phi one minus i phi two for square root of two, define one forms on CGN. And the other field that we have on the Riemann surface is the z z bar component of the field strength which we will denote by f, just f. So the solutions that uh, the, the BPS configurations are in fact solution of the self-dual Yamil's equations on this Riemann surface. And these equations were studied by Hitchin, and not mistaken, 1987, 
IP 1986. But they're known as the Hitchin equation. And they take this form, F plus phi. Here I define, uh, actually, this F if the two form. And then I define phi to be phi z dz, phi bar to be phi z bar dz bar. And then these equations are f plus the commutator of these two is equal to zero. The anti-holomorphic derivative of phi plus, um, actually, let me start from phi bar. So the holomorphic derivative of phi bar plus a phi bar is equal to zero. And then we have the anti-holomorphic derivative of phi plus the commutator. So these are two holomorphic and anti-holomorphic covariant derivatives. But this we do not take, this last one, we do not take it to be zero, but rather we take it to be the sum from k goes from one to n, theta k sigma three, delta squared of z minus zk. So these are the positions of the punctures. And so the specific type of punctures that we're considering is the simplest one. And they're defined by singular boundary conditions for this field phi. Uh, and these are delta function type boundary conditions. And furthermore, it will be important that these equations can be also written as the flatness of a curly A connection on the Rima surface, which is just A. Uh, here A is AZ dz, AZ bar, AZ bar, AZ bar. So the flatness of this connection here for any value of z. So f will be zeta uh, theta k sigma 3 delta squared of z minus k. And this tells us what, if we're able to solve these equations, this tells us what this quadratic differential that we had at the beginning is. Because in the classes picture, the original picture, this Coulomb branch was parameterized by the BEV of this O2. But now we have this Hitchin system picture, this Hitchin picture, where B is parameterized by the gauge invariant combinations of this field phi. And so we find that phi two is just one half trace of this phi squared. And this is our quadratic differential. And of course, we need to solve this Hitchin equation to, to, to write the differential explicitly. So we can do it in an example. So as before, as I said before, our example will always be the sphere with four singular points. 0, 1, t, infinity. And actually, let me write this in a new page. And copy the Hitchin equations. So we want to solve these equations and we take this A um, plus A bar to be a trivial flat connection. So some G of Z, Z bar inverse times G of VG of Z, Z bar. Trivial flat connection. And because we're on the Riemann sphere, we can, a trivial flat connection can be completely gauged away. 
And so we transform the, the previous curly A to G um, A, or, or well, you can also just think of it as transformation on this. Uh, no, it, it's fine. It's curly A. It's G A, G inverse minus G inverse DG. Um, I hope I wrote this. Uh, well, let's say that this is morally true modulo the, the conjugation side, which I might have gotten confused about. Um, and also we have to perform the same transformation on the Higgs field. So we have this G phi G inverse, and I will define this to be called L, the Higgs field in this gauge. And we can write down the Hitchin equations in this gauge. And so here, F is just zero. It's uh, A is the trivial flat coverage. And also this A and A bar are just equal to zero. So at the end, the equation that we have the, the second equation just tells us that d phi bar is equal to zero. So phi bar would be an anti-holomorphic differential on the Riemann surface. But there's no such object. There's, there are no anti-holomorphic differential on, the, on this Riemann surface, on, on a sphere. So this C04, so phi in this case, phi bar in this case is just zero. And the other equation just tells us that D bar L is equal to some, well, this was actually just four, uh, the ZK R01, Infinity. And this d bar L is sum of g of z theta k sigma 3 g of z inverse times the delta function. And of course, this delta function makes it so that this g of z are just evaluated as z equals to zk. And we can call this a k equal this g k theta k sigma three g k inverse, and so this tells us that d bar l is the sum of a k delta squared z minus z k. Now, of course, we can use just d bar one over z is equal to delta. And then we find that this Higgs field, uh, this phi is also known as Higgs field, but this field L is just, in this case, some A0 of Z plus AT of Z minus T plus A1 of Z minus one. And this every AK is in the conjugacy class of theta k times sigma three. So this is just, we're taking one vacuum, we're fixing all the parameters of the theory and we're looking everything at that vacuum. But this uh, moduli space of vacuum actually depends on the complex structure of the theory of, of this Riemann surface. So a, a reasonable question is what happens if, if we deform the complex structure of this uh, surface? Well, a complex uh, structure is just 
defining what is the anti-holomorphic differential at every point in the ring. What, what are the anti-holomorphic fun the, the holomorphic functions uh, at every point on the uh, Riemann surface? So we induce this change in complex structure by doing this infinitesimal change uh, in the polarization z z bar. So we set z to z minus epsilon and z bar to we keep it the same. And we call the transform coordinate w and w bar. Now, if we look at what happens to the differentials, we have that to first to linear order, we're doing an infinitesimal transformation. So to linear order, this dw is dz plus dz bar, dz bar epsilon. They're an appropriate rescaling also. And this we call mu of z, z bar, and it's called a Beltrami differential. Instead, the w bar is just the same. So how does the, the connection, this connection curly A, how does it change the flat connection under this change of coordinates? Well, we can write curly A as AZ dZ plus AW dW. And the connection itself doesn't change, but oh, sorry, not AW, uh, AZ bar dZ bar. The connection itself doesn't change, but its components with respect to the transform coordinates will because this is equal to aw dw plus aw bar dw bar by definition. And then we just substitute the dw and the dw bar from above. And we find that this is aw dz plus aw bar minus mu aw dz bar. So we know that this AZ is the same as AW, while AZ bar uh, is mm, yes, is AW minus mu AW bar minus mu AW. And we also have another piece of information because the original coordinate z and z bar didn't know about this mu. The mu comes into play only when we change the coordinates. So the dependence of az and a and z, a and z bar on this Beltrami differential is zero. So putting everything together, we have that az is aw, z bar is aw bar minus mu aw. And so this tells us that d aw in d mu is equal to zero, but also that d aw bar is equal to in d mu is equal to mu times aw. As this give us an additional set of equations that tells us how the quantities, how these fields uh, change under the formations of the modular of the Riemann surface. So we arrived at this deformed Hitchin equations. See, yeah, I still have the Hitchin equations here. And these are still the same. But then I get also that dt of a plus phi is equal to zero. And that dt of a bar plus phi bar, this t is any specific complex modulus of the Riemann surface. And the change in this modulus is generated by some 
a specific Beltramic differential mu t. And so we get these other two equations. So we're getting kind of a, an augmented Hitchin system, deformed Hitchin system. Let me copy it and so also make them a bit smaller. Because now we want to study these equations in the same in the same case that uh, we did before, let's say, to stay again concrete. So let's uh, specialize again to C04, four, four puncture sphere. So these equations, these three equations are still the same. We have that L is the sum of this AK in the conjugacy classes of uh, theta k sigma 3. But now this AK cannot be just arbitrary. They must depend in a very specific way on the moduli of the Riemann surface for this deformation to be consistent. And this is the content of these last two equations. So the first equation tells us that 0 is dt times g minus 1 lg plus g minus 1 dzg. This is just remembering what uh, th that this a said was g minus 1 dzg and phi was uh, g minus 1 lg. So if we do some algebra on this, and we also define mt to be, uh, uh, it's an unfortunate notation. Uh, let's call it pt to be dsg g inverse. Now, this equation here becomes g inverse dt l plus dz bt plus l commutator bt g is equal to zero. And these are the lax equations for, uh, in, in general, these are the lax equation for some isomonodromic system. In this specific case, it is known that this, once you write everything down, every, all the components explicitly can be reduced to Pan-Levé six, the six Pan-Levé equations. So the deformation theory of this pure, of this SU2 superior Mills that was this class S theory, going through this Hitchin system turned out to be governed by the six Pan-Levé equations. And the thing, the, the thing that determines this Bt is the second equation, which uh, if we write it down explicitly, tells us that dz bar Bt is this Beltrami differential times L. And if we write this Beltrami differential, it's some distribution. Uh, but this, the solution to this yields that uh, this bt is a t over z minus t. Now, the, the other relevant part for to, to end the picture with isomonodromic deformation is that why are these deformations called isomonodromic? Is that uh, these equations, all, all, all these equations here, these deformed Hitchin equations, are the compatibility of the following linear system. Um, dzy is equal to ly, dty is bty, and dz bar y is equal to zero. 
And remember that this L was the sum of AK over Z minus ZK. And just by looking at how the solution behaves close to one of these ZKs, and remember this, remembering that this AK uh, where GK theta K sigma three GK inverse, Y uh, will be Z minus ZK to the theta K sigma three times GK. So this is why um, these are called isomonodromic deformations because we're moving in this case, the moduli are just the punctures, the positions of the punctures, and there's only one for, for our P1 minus zero, one, T infinity. There's only one that can be moved. It's this because the other ones we can fix by symmetry. So we're moving that, but we're keeping fixed these things here. And this tells us that our monodromy is around ZK are gk e to the 2 pi i theta k sigma 3 gk inverse. So we are keeping fixed the monodromies, but we are deforming the complex module. Finally, the, the way that we that you, you have for sure already seen in previous lecture is that all these flows are Hamiltonian and they're generated by these uh, Hamiltonians, which are just the residue at the punctures of the trace of S squared. Remember that this was exactly uh, our quadratic, our original quadratic differential um, that, um, that is now it's the form because it's not a, just a differential anymore, it's, it's a connection itself. And the generating function for these Hamiltonians is called the tau function. And this is the main object of study in the theory of van Leeuwen equations. Uh, and it is the main player in the Kiev formula. And this is uh, what I will start describing in the final part of the talk. But uh, the conceptual reason of why these uh, deformations, these pan equations enter into these physical theories, because one, one could uh, just, it's, it's not really obvious, at least, that uh, you have these uh, nonlinear differential equations and these uh, uh, quadratic differential of, uh, on uh, Riemann surfaces, linear systems, how is this related in any way to any supersymmetry? Uh, it is related in a rather convoluted way, but uh, they are the deformations on the, of the moduli space of vacuum of this theory. And the more quantitative connection between the two sides is given by actually sorry can, can i ask a yes ah, so uh in the previous slide yes uh, maybe one more so you you have you had the uh, five equations yes uh, and uh could you remind me again how, how did you get the fourth and fifth equation where, where did where did these equations come so the fourth and fifth equation uh, came from following what this change of variables uh, did to our connection A. Remember that A was this non setting the parameter zeta uh, to one for simplicity, but it was this. Mm. This is the flat connection. Okay. And we want to see 
how it change how its component in Z and W coordinates are related. And you you just write down so you have a is a z d z plus a z bar d z bar, right? Also, it's also just by definition of what are its components, right? A w d w plus a w bar d w bar. These are all curly a. I'm sorry if that was confusing. Um, and then here you can write uh, this equation that just comes from substituting z into this formula. It, well, the, the expression for w, right? Mm -hmm. We said dw is dz minus the epsilon. And then do some algebra and some rescaling, and you find this infinitesimal uh, deformation equation. Mm -hmm. And so here you can write aw times dz minus dz bar dz bar epsilon. And so this aw enters, this is, well, dz bar epsilon, it was mu. This mu aw enters in the anti-holomorphic component. And finally, we set, so the delta on delta mu, there is no dependence on the Beltrami differential of these two components. Because the AZ and AZ bar, the, the, the Z and Z bar coordinates were defined irrespective of this, they, they were defined prior to this change of coordinates. So in the transformed connection, there's no dependence in, in the AZ and Z bar, there's no dependence on mu, but this gives uh, an equation in terms of the new, when you are in the new coordinates, the ones in which you're changing the moduli. Oh, I see, thank you. Any, any other questions? I feel that this this might be uh, either many elementary for many people or uh, very obscure for uh, another big chunk of the, of the people. But uh, I hope at least to have kind of conveyed the kind of the line of thought that brings you from um, physical theories to Van Lebe equations. And here, um, right, I was writing the Kiev formula. So the Kiev formula relates uh, in a very explicit way the supersymmetric theory and, uh, and the tau function, because the formula states that the tau function is equal to the, what is called the dual partition function of the gauge theory. Now the dual partition function is just, I'll uh, explain uh, in a minute, the meaning of these parameters. So we have this sum over n, this is dual partition function. And this is the actual partition function of the theory. Uh, this would be defined in a specific uh, regime of the theory, which is called the self-dual omega background. I don't want to enter into that. That would require a whole other range of notions. And I'm pretty sure that Sebiok will uh, talk way more uh, about omega backgrounds in the, in the next talk. So this A and eta um, are just, think of doing a pan's decomposition of, let's write it again for our four puncture sphere. But this is true for any Riemann surface, this idea. 
think of doing a pass decomposition of the pore punctures here, and the punctures are the external legs. So we have zero, T, one, infinity. And then at every puncture, at every circle in the puncture, you attach this parameter theta k. Remember that these parameters theta k, so here you have theta zero, theta t, here you have theta one, and here you have theta infinity. Remember that these were parameterizing the monodromies uh, of the solution of the linear system that we obtained around these circles. And then you have the this circle that you're gluing and the monodromy around this circle is parameterized by A in the same way. While eta enters in parameterizing the monodromy around this circle here. And so this A and eta are dual monodromy coordinates. And uh, in terms of the gauge theory, this is the uh, VEV in the ultraviolet of the scalar of the SU2 uh, Yam, super Yam Mills theory. This uh, is called the ultraviolet Coulomb parameter. And this is the dual magnetic variable. But everything is very clear if you think of them as uh, parameters, as parameterizing the monodromies of this linear system on the uh, prima surface in the class S construction. So uh, this, there is a caveat. So this, uh, formula tau is equal to zd, uh, strictly speaking, it requires correction, requires corrections for g greater than zero. Uh, there's some very non-trivial factor between the two. Uh, you, you can, I can refer to my PhD thesis for more details on, on this, uh, but I, I don't want to go into the higher genus case because that's just higher level of complication uh, for, a, for an introductory lecture. So what I want to show now is that the combinatorics that come in the gauge that come from the gauge theory. So we have this e to the i and eta, sum is over integers, z of a plus n. And this z of a has itself an expansion, which you can write as a sum over pairs of partitions, so pairs of Young diagrams of two objects, one that we can call Z 3.1, let me copy also this uh, as the composition because this is the picture that you have to keep in mind in the formulas. So you have uh, Z 3.1, the depend which means that it's related to the first trinion, the second trinion, these pairs of pans, which are these three-point sphere in which we decompose the four-point sphere are called trinions. And this depend on the monodromy parameters only of one of these uh, trinions in the decomposition. So we have a sum over an integer over pairs of Young diagrams weighted by t to the length of the Young diagram. 
So this is the full combinatorics that comes out of the dual partition function. And we want to show that this same combinatorial expansion comes from the tau function, uh, which is defined once you define it in an appropriate way. Once you write it down in, a, in an appropriate way, it's not about definition. The definition is the one uh, from before that generates the Hamiltonians. So the way that one writes the tau function down analytically, at least uh, in this context, is as a freedom determinant. And first, I want to spend a few words about why this expression of the tau function as a Fredon determinant is physically important. Because if you have the Kiev formula, so the tau function is a dual partition function, and then you write the tau function as a determinant of some well-defined operator, this object is fully non-perturbative. It's just some very, some analytically well-defined object on this Riemann surface. So we're fully non-perturbative and analytically explicit. So it actually contains more information than what you had at the beginning, because the description of this theory, as I said uh, in this case, it was uh, SU2 gauge theory coupled to some matter, is valid in some region of this uh, of the mo of the moduli space of the classes theory. This is just what is called a gauge theory phase. But then uh, you and in this uh, in this context, it corresponds to taking this parameter t uh, in the puncture between uh, lesser than one. Less, it's modulus to be lesser than one. But once you have this kind of expressions, you can compute everything in different regimes. So you, you can make statements about what happens if instead the theory is strongly coupled. In some cases, these theories, you can't say that it is a gauge theory coupled to something because they will be non-Lagrangian, but still this freedom determinant is completely well-defined. So the other uh, good property of the freedom determinant from the physical point of view is that uh, it, oops, it doesn't require a classical action. While the traditional way in which these partition functions are computed starts from the classical action and uses methods that are known as uh, equivariant homology, equivariant localization. Uh, but here, you don't need a classical action. So you have a hope of computing these partition functions also in case this where you wouldn't be able to compute it otherwise. And the main idea of uh, the way that we write then this freedom determinant is to study this uh, uh, Penn's decomposition. If we want then to go into, into concrete coordinates and to write it explicitly, you go in a Penn's decomposition. And so you split this linear system that has poles at zero, one, t, and then there's also a pole at infinity into this, ah, I'm sorry, this uh, I was calling y before. This I split into this two, three point linear system. So into linear system that have only three poles, one over z uh, minus t, this set y3.2 a0 to z 
plus a1 2 over z minus 1. So this first linear system has poles at 0, t, infinity, and the second linear system has poles at 0, 1, infinity. But the 3 by 3, uh, the, the, the 2 by 2, these are all 2 by 2 linear system because we started with the uh, all matrices that were in SL2. These are all two by two uh, matrices, two by two linear systems. So the linear system with three poles on the Riemann sphere is completely solved. It's because you can reduce it to a hypergeometric equation. So all the entries of this, uh, again, this uh, Y. 3.k are just some explicit 2 by 2 matrices with entries given by some Gauss hypergeometric functions. If we had chosen different geometries with different types of punctures, we would have gotten some different set of special functions, but this is what you generally get. Uh, you, you write down everything in terms of, a, in a complicated way, but in terms of known special functions. And the precise statement is the following theorem by Gavrilenko. Uh, 2018. Well, the archive would be 2016. This is the published date. So let me copy again this small bands decomposition. And so we have this circle C and define this Hilbert space, which is the L2 functions on this circle C, tensor C2. So vector valued functions in L2. And split it into positive and negative. So here you have some L2 space. A function will have its Fourier decomposition. And these are just positive and negative Fourier modes. It's just expanding, fully expanding uh, a function on a circle. So it's like z to the n powers, essentially, in the complex plane. And then we can write the tau function of pan levy 6, because remember this uh, four puncture sphere corresponded to pan levy 6, in the following way, t of a squared minus theta zero squared minus theta t squared. Then another explicit prefactor times the determinant on this Hilbert space H of one minus K, where this K is the following operator. Now I'll, I'll just write everything down. This is in this H plus H minus the composition, and this A are just some explicitly given integrable kernels. So this A is this Y2 of Z Y2 of W inverse minus I2 over Z minus W, and it goes from uh, H minus to H plus. And an analogous expression you have for this D that goes in the opposite way. But the point is that this determinant uh, over uh, L space on a circle is written in terms of this Y2 and Y1 that are explicitly known in terms of hypergeometrics. And this is true also for the N, N puncture sphere. This is true also for the n-puncture torus. 
arguably it should be true also for higher genus, uh, but that is still uh, left to prove. And the main statement is that if you compute explicitly this determinant, you get the combinatorics of the uh, of this dual partition function. And I want to at least uh, show you how this combinatorics arises. Of course, we do not have time to compute the explicit form of the coefficients, but the, the Kiev formula is relatively easy to write down. So the first thing to do is to write this determinant of 0, a, d0 in terms of a sum over its minors. And its minors are just the principal minors of the operator a times the principal minor of the operator d. So, so, so is, just to make sure, yes. so are you going to assume the theorem and then try to prove the Kiev formula? Is that what you're trying to do? Or, or are you going to explain the theorem itself? No, so I, uh, to prove the theorem, uh, you would have to show that the derivative with respect to time of this tau function yes. gives uh, the Hamiltonian, the logarithmic derivative. Yes. But I will assume the theorem. Uh, okay. I don't think that we would learn much from its proof. Mm -hmm. uh, what I want to show is that one can use this determinant to compute this combinatorics expansion and how one goes on go, goes to compute this combinatorics okay, expansion from the from the determinant. I see, I see. So obtain the expansion for the tau function and then yes. compare with the grouping for the necros of uh, yeah or the dual partition function on the gauge theory side. I see. They are by proving well, the no, no, the point is no. that uh, you compute the determinant. You do the minor expansion of the determinant. Yes. And then the Nekrasov function just come, come out from the computation. You don't need a more gauge mm -hmm. theory input mm -hmm. at this point. OK, good. And that is why it can be useful in cases where you don't know how to compute Nekrasov partition functions. Mm -hmm. OK, good. Um, so right. Um, so we, we have this. Uh, can I ask? Yes, of course. Um, do you have some explicit meaning for the factor one minus t to the minus theta something? Is that related to u one factor of the? Yes, they they, they are related to the u one factor uh, in the Nikrasov partition function. Uh, essentially, it's so because uh, if you think about. Uh, like the residue at the punctures. Uh, before we were saying that the residues are theta minus theta. But it, also in AGT, in the AGT correspondence, you find that actually uh, you would have to use this parameterization. And this corresponds to some U2 rather than SU2, mm -hmm. and then you specialize. And these two are related by U1 gauge transformation. And this U1 gauge transformation is what gives you these extra factors. Mm. Um, well, it, it, it follows just by performing explicitly the gauge transformation in the Lux matrix and then computing the residues at T, at 1. I, I, can, I can maybe. Since I'm almost out of time, maybe I can tell you after. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Um, I just want to this this final point um, before I'm out of time. Um, so the way that you compute these objects, these principal minors, is really that you write down this A of Z and W in their Fourier expansion, because here we are on a circle, right? So 
I write the Fourier expansions of these kernels. I write it in this way. And this P and Q are some positive half integers. But for those of you who are familiar with three fermions um, in integrable hierarchies, uh, this might already be quite familiar because then to compute these determinants, you, you treat these kernels as some infinite matrices. This A, uh, P, Q are each two by two matrices because they were defined in terms of this, uh, they defined by the Fourier expansion of this Y2, which was a two by two matrix. And so if I write this uh, K, it was zero, A, D, zero. Uh, I can write it as some infinite matrix in this way. So I have A one half minus one half, one, two, A one half minus one half, two, two. And these are the components of A one half minus one half. And then it comes a uh, one a three halves. Let's say ah sorry a three halves minus one half. This is another two by two matrix. A one half minus three half, and this is another two by two matrix. And in this way, I just have some infinite matrix and this is my operator a so picking out a minor of this operator really means picking up picking out some minor of this infinite matrix by picking rows and columns so something like this and each row is labeled by a half integer, well, by two sets of half integers, but two half integers. And P and Q, let's say. So we have P and Q, but this is kind of tensor two because you have to pick one for every uh, color of the matrix. Let me just do a specific example. Well, maybe I don't have time, but uh, the point is that if I, here I have two half integers and a color index for a row, but then I have the same thing for a column because I have to pick up both rows and columns. And in terms of, and this this uh, this data is the same as that of what is called the charged Yan diagram. In terms of the Yan diagram, let's say that I have some Yan diagram like this. I will have some integer which is just p the sum of all the p plus q which is called the charge of the Yan diagram. And then this is kind of the center, the, the, the origin by which I'm measuring the Yan diagram. And then all the other half integers are measured with respect to this. This is the charge, which is an integer. And then the length of all the rows this is P1, P2, P3, Q1, Q2, Q3. All the length of the rows and columns of the Yan diagrams are measured with respect to this center. And I have two Yan diagrams because I have uh, two sets of half integers coming from picking out the minor. So this is kind of what is giving you the label of the labeling of these minors. Why these minors are labeled 
by pairs of partitions and an integer. So the theorem then it can be written as a sum over this charge, sum over pairs of partitions of these minors that are labeled by pairs of partition and integer. And these are fully explicit. So one really computes the Fourier integer, the, the Fourier coefficients of hypergeometrics and finds that this is this set 3.1, while this is Z 3.2, e to the i and eta, and t to the length of y. And so this is kind of uh, the, the computation out of which uh, the Kiev formula comes out if one just starts from uh, the tau function. And then one recovers the, the class of functions. But of course, we can, we can do this for more general classes theories. Uh, you just have to follow this, this construction from the beginning. Uh, sorry if I, the, the last part was a, a bit of a rush. I just uh, wanted to kind of convey the message that you can really compute everything starting from the tau function and the combinatorics just comes out of this minor expansion. We can generalize in several ways. You can take more uh, punctures on the sphere, and this was done by uh, Gabrielenko, Capasso, Lisovi. Uh, you can take irregular punctures, which was done by them, also by uh, Harini Desiraju for uh, geometry that corresponds to rather uh, our Tristaglas theories with Pasha Gavrilenko, uh, and then later on with Harini Desiraj, we generalized this to genus one. And now uh, with, um, you can generalize it also to orthogonal group instead of just SLN. There are several types of generalization that, that you can do. And this is all kind of work in progress. But uh, I'm out of time, so I'll just stop here. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so time for questions. Oh, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah, so you introduced uh, the magnetic variable eta, and mm -hmm. there is a, yeah, for, for the expression uh, for the tau function, uh, there, is, um, there is a summation of uh, uh, integers n. Yes. Um, and uh, okay, this expression uh, reminds me of a uh, toast to operator. Uh, Absolutely. So, and, and there is also a shift of the um, um, electric parameter a, a. So, can you yeah, comment uh, on this? So, can you explain uh, what is known, okay, uh, if any, you know, what, what is known around this line of uh, interpretation? Right. So, uh, actually, for, for this, um, it is convenient to, to relate everything to, to AGT, to conformal blocks, because mm -hmm. at least this is uh, uh, how I understand it better. So this solution, remember, you had this uh, dzy is equal to ly, this solution to the linear system. Mm -hmm. Now, this is uh, the solution of some strings of vertex operators inserted at the puncture and some uh, free fermions. And these are multi component free fermions. So normalized in this way. Now, so are you considering the product of the Liouville theory and the free, and free fermion? Yes, exactly. So these free fermions can be constructed by bosonization from degenerate fields. But the point, the problem is that if you just used uh, your Vira Soro Verma module, if you just used uh, standard AGT, let's say, then you would have that the uh, vacuum expectation of the topped loop, uh, this would be something like uh, e to the i eta, uh, well, conformal block of a plus one plus e to the minus eta conformal block at, of a minus one, something like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you see here, 
you want that this solution really transform goes into itself with some matrix multiplication if you perform the monodromy operation. So I want that, for example, here, I would want that uh, if I do some analytical continuation around the cycle gamma, this goes to Y of Z times uh, the monodromy matrix. Well, this would be kind of operator valued if I pick this uh, conformal block to be the solution. So to, to obtain something that uh, really is single valued, I need to take all the possible, if you want, all, all the possible top operators, because then in this way, this will, uh, will not get shipped because all the shifts are absorbed into this fluid series. And this corresponds to taking an extra U1 charge, uh, which is the free fermion charge. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, I don't understand uh, the details, but okay. Thank you very much. In this sense, the, the, the Toft and, uh, and, and Wilson operators would be the traces of these monotropes. Mm -hmm. but, um, but they're in a free fermion theory uh, rather than just uh, AGT. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a longer story, but this is kind of the idea. You need to introduce an extra U1 charge so that you have a basis in which the monodromies are just as uh, so complex value matrices instead of operators. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, I have a question. So can you try to use this type of logic, uh, well, probably apply to more punctures, et cetera, to, mm -hmm. to compute the net cross of partition function for uh, irregular, I mean, series associated with irregular singularities, like RGX Douglas theory. N so, maybe you, you can try to group things together, obtain the expression, and then from, as you say, from the building blocks, you get a combinatorial expression for the necrosal factor, and then try to degenerate, uh, uh, take a limit, and that, that you give rise to, in principle, to uh, the, the RGX Douglas theory. Oh, right, yes, that, that, that you, can, you can do, take, the limit, but the problem is that this is a very singular limit at the level of tau function. So if you do it this way, you would get only asymptotic series. Ah, I see. Uh, but so there is uh, an intrinsic way to define th this uh, freedom determinant expression has been derived um, by Harini Desiraju for the um, Argyris Douglas. Uh, well, the, the one with the quartic separate with Kirk. Uh, I don't remember, H2 maybe. Um, anyway, the, the one that uh, comes from the generation of a uh, two flavor theory. Mm -hmm. And, but the problem there is that this Hilbert space is on an infinite line. It's like IR maybe, something like that. Anyway, it's, it, it's on some infinite line. And so it's a problem to do the combinatorics because you don't have your, your discrete basis for the space. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you need to come up with, uh, um, with some extra ideas to, to treat. Oh, well, let's see, but uh, I see. But maybe, maybe something like an integral instead of a combinatorial sum. But, uh, yes. Uh, I see, but that, 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 that would you have be to kind, do something kind of like more it. natural, but mm -hmm. uh, you, it's not this combinatorial uh, I see, I see, thing, I see. right? Uh -huh. I see, I see. It's still a very explicit uh, expression. Even, even in that case, you have this uh, determinant that you can compute the asymptotics, you can uh, compute the asymptotics, what order you can afford, mm -hmm. we're given some time, and it's written explicitly in terms of some special functions. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. But it's not completely clear how to resum it then. Uh, I see, I see. And then but there's, no, there's nothing to resum. Uh -huh. Because this is intrinsically non perturbative. You can expand it, mm -hmm. right? But the expression itself, it's already resumed, if you want. Yeah, uh, that, sorry, but that, that's what I'm confused about. If it's a resum, then, then why, why can't you take a limit? Uh... You can take a limit. You just don't know what is a nice basis okay. in which you get nice formulas. You can study this object and write down its expansion. 
but you would like to write an expansion in which all the coefficients oh, are I see. explicit. Oh, okay. so you can, I, see, I see. So you can take a remit and you obtain some expression, but the, the structure, the combinatorial structure is gone. So you, yeah. So okay. how to extract the Necrosov partition function becomes non-trivial. I see, I see. That's what you mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. I, can, I can make an extra comment on this. Oh, yes. Okay. Here's the, the author. The, the issue is really not the limit. You can take the limit. You can absolutely take the limit, and you do oh. get everything. So uh, this was done in a paper by Bonelli and Tanzini um, with, with Oleg Glissovi and some others. So the issue is really not the limit. You can take the Pendeve 6 um, series and you can take the limit to Pendeve 2. And that is a continuous limit. You, can, you do get the asymptotic expansion, but the thing is in Pendeve 2, you only have the asymptotic series. You can't have anything else. So now what happens if you want to prove their conjecture, let's say, to be much more rigorous, is that you take the basis. The basis is still not an issue because you still have a basis even on a, on, on a line. Mm -hmm. But the issue is decoupling it just in terms of monogamy data. So the, the issue is very, very technical. And it's, uh, it's, it's, at the, it's at the level of how do you express these things in a nice way let's say hmm. so you can write an expression but it's not nice i see and that happens only when you go to pan level two or you go to three or four for example is, is the same problem there or so for three it's not a problem so for the oh. upper level of pan level equations everything is quite nice oh, i see uh -huh. the lower level is very hard interesting yeah <laughs> probably oh. there is some physics in it yeah mm -hmm. Let me so, actually share uh, my screen here. Yes. So this is uh, the, the geometries for, can you see the, yes. the picture? So this is the geometry for the all, for all Panleve equations. So you start from six, go from five, three, and this corresponds to taking uh, SU2 yeah, superior meals with four flavors, uh, three, two, one, zero. And this lower part is the, the generation to uh, yes. RGS Douglas. But you see here, you're gluing a circle. In all these, have a, because you have a vector multiple in terms of physics. But here you don't. Mm -hmm. But all the com nice combinatorics here comes because you're gluing this circle. I see. I see. And, okay, that's the yeah, so, so when you have the this trinion here, you have this uh, hypergeometric function. Then also for the uh, superior meals with flavors, you, you also have expansion. You also can derive the Nekrasov formula for this case. It's just you get Whittaker function, that's Bessel functions. Now, in, in the bottom half, you can see that there are two which are more like cups, and there is one with like a zero. So uh, the two Jimbo Miva and Penlevé one can be solved in the sense that I can write a determinant formula for both of them. But for the other two, I have no idea. If you go to Penlevé 4, it's, it's extremely hard. But uh, so this paper has different conjectures about um, Necrosov partition functions for all these cases. And what they do is they go from Penlevé 6 and they take these limits, as you were saying. If you See, want okay. the. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I see. I, I remember that I'm a chair, so I'm supposed to keep the time. So let's see. Any any other quick questions? Uh, may I have one question? Uh, yes, ask yes, one yes. question. Yes. Um, please, so, ahead. for example, in the case of Panve six, uh, the tau function is known to satisfy a bilinear differential equation. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if uh, this bilinear equation can be derived directly from the freedom determinant expression. Is something worked out in, in that direction? So no, I, I don't think, to my knowledge, uh, from the determinant, this hasn't been derived. This has been derived from conformal field theory. But actually, so this determinant is written in a very analogous way to the way that one writes uh, determinant expressions for tau functions using free fermions in integrable height. Right. So I think that one should be able to write an analogous uh, form of the Hirota equation 
mm -hmm. this way, but uh, I don't know of anyone that has done this. I see. Thank you very much. I see. Great. So some other questions? Uh... Okay, so I think we can spare some of the questions. And uh, so 